Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Simon Phipps joins me. We're going to be talking about hacks, a great way to have a powerful WYSIWYG system on your CMS. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Simon Phipps, episode 495, recorded August 29th, 2018, Hacks. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. Learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash floss. And by DigitalOcean, the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications. Over 150,000 businesses rely on DigitalOcean to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry-leading price performance. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash floss. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week... The movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may be using every day and totally unaware of it, projects you may want to download and play with right after this show. I have a feeling today is going to be one of those. So joining me once again is my lovely and talented co-host, Simon Phipps. Simon, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, Randall. I'm fresh back from Og Camp in Sheffield in the UK, uh, full of excitement and, and tiredness after an exciting conference, and looking forward to finding out about this hacks stuff that we have down here today. Do you know anything about it? Well, we're going to get to that in just a second. I uh, just want to ask, where, where, are we, where are we looking at you? What's your background there? What are you doing? Where, are you back in your home? This is, this is, my, this is, this is the, the headquarters, the nexus of my empire. Um, I, this is the, the, the cedar cabin at the end of the garden, um, complete with all sorts of beautiful things. If your listeners can't see the wonderful typewriter that I have behind you, which is 60 years old. They can't see the... Uh, Floss United uh, football scarf or soccer scarf that I have on the wall. They can't see my patents provided to me by IBM Corporation on the wall behind me. But that's that's what they would be able to see if they were watching the video stream. Absolutely. And I am the same place I was last week, uh, although, oh, actually not, because when I taped it last week, I think I was, no, I was still sitting right here. Uh, my view, that I'm on the 10th floor of uh, some condos that I own, have a partial ownership in, and I'm staring right at the Atlantic Ocean, and it's a beautiful day. Uh, right after I finish this show, I'm going to walk across the street and get some food because uh, I haven't had a chance yet this morning. And uh, uh, I will be gone tomorrow. But I'll talk about that at the end of the show. So let's talk about Hacks. So Hacks describes itself as an open source tool which aims to make online course creation accessible to all instructors. Now, this particularly appeals to me on a couple of levels, well, multiple levels, actually. One is that I am a content creator. Uh, you know, I write courses as part of my living. I wrote uh, the top published uh, 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 book about uh, Perl uh, beginning tutorial, and I also had a course that went along with that. So I'm all about that, but I'm not really big yet into online courses. So as I started studying for this, studying, yes, I'm studying for this show, <laughs> as I started doing that, um, I, I, I sort of looked at it, and this appeals to me on an, an entirely different level, too, because I was playing with Polymer, which is what this is sort of all based around, web components and Polymer. Uh, but I'm not much of a front-end developer. I have, I've since kind of migrated over to doing anything I want to do with front-end to uh, Angular Dart, so I've kind of moved away from the Polymer space and the web component space. But uh, I see a lot of really cool things going on here and a lot of, uh, a lot of sort of things coming together that will make it really, really easy for people to build rich, powerful content, not have to learn really weird codes. I must have watched about two hours of YouTube videos this morning uh, trying to figure out what this is about. Um, the one thing I found rather distressing, and uh, we'll have to get into it with our, our, our guests, which are, we'll bring on in a couple minutes, uh, that'd be Brian Olendike and Nikki Massaro Kaufman. Hopefully I didn't mispronounce either of those. And they're sort of the two key members, the two original members of the team that's producing Hacks. The one thing I found sort of odd is I didn't find a lot of written documentation. I don't learn well from YouTube videos except for things where you have to move things around. And I didn't find a lot of written documentation, which scared me. It's like, this thing's built for designing courses. Where are the courses on this that are online? So hopefully they will straighten me out about why that doesn't need to exist or that they're actually on their way 
doing that. Anyway, uh, what do you know about this so far? I, I know absolutely nothing about this. Um, I, I've looked at it. Uh, you know, I write quite a lot of stuff as well. Um, I have generally found that writing uh, anything other than words uh, formatted on a page in a font uh, is is something that's beyond my capabilities. I understand how to program it, but I have no idea how to author it. So this is a, a fascinating set of tools to me. The one thing that I that immediately springs to mind looking at uh, some of the examples here is that this is a very powerful tool that gives you everything you need to author content except for the good taste necessary to make it look good. And uh, so I'll be interested to understand whether the uh, creators behind this are trying to program in ways of, of nudging people in the direction of good taste, you know, and uh, avoiding the 21st century equivalent of blink tags in their uh, uh, work. So I'm looking forward to finding out all about this and how I can use it with the environments where I write. I write in WordPress. I write in Drupal. And uh, I write in um, uh, a text editor with Mark Markdown. Yeah, I mean, it's probably the same problem that when the laser writer first came out, how the resumes after that got an uh, order of magnitude <laughs> worse because people would mix 20 yes. fonts into their thing and, and lay out it all weird ways and just putting it on a typewriter would have actually been a lot better. Well, we're about to bring on our guest, but before we do that, I do have an important message because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Let's talk about buying a home for a minute. Because of rising interest rates, there's a lot of unpredictability when it comes to buying a home these days. It's causing a lot of anxiety with folks. Well, our friends at Quicken Loans are doing something about that. They're calling it the power buying process, and here's how it works. Quicken Loans will verify your income, assets, and credit with less than 24 hours to give you a verified approval. This gives you the strength of a cash buyer. Once you're verified, you qualify for their all-new exclusive Rate Shield approval. First, they'll lock up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. Now, here's the best part. If rates go up, your rate stays the same. But if rates go down, your rate also drops. Either way, you win. It's the kind of thinking you'd expect from America's largest mortgage lender. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash floss. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply, based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states. NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. That's rocketmortgage.com slash F-L-O-S-S. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of Floss Weekly. Let's go ahead and bring out our guests. Let's uh, first welcome on Brian Olendike. Please welcome to the show. Hey, Randall. How's it going? It's going well. And where are you speaking to us from? I am in my basement in luxurious State College, Pennsylvania. Okay. So you're uh, this way from me, I guess, up, up the coast. All right. Good. <laughs> and uh, also, let's bring on Nikki Massaro Kaufman. Welcome to the show. Hi. Hi, and where are you speaking to us from? I'm speaking from Altoona, Pennsylvania. It's about 80 miles outside of Pittsburgh and 40 miles outside of uh, University Park, Penn State University, and the uh, start of student semester. So I'm free of traffic. Okay, very cool, very cool. And I was a little <laughs> confused when I kept seeing PSU in, in your in your documentation and, and some of the videos. Because for me, PSU, since I'm a Portlander, is Portland State. And so, uh, that, no, but that isn't that's next to our name. That's actually it's it's PDX Uni University or something like that. We, we had to pick something different because you guys have PSU. So anyway, let's go back to uh, Brian to start this out. Uh, give us a thirty thousand foot view. When somebody is reaching for hacks, what is the problem they're trying to solve? So. Hacks is attempting to be kind of a next generation WYSIWYG um, as far as the ease of implementation and as far as like what would happen if we built this tool using modern tooling. Uh, so it's not to knock things like CK Editor or Tiny MCE or these other open source projects that have come before us. It's just they're built on this construct of let's edit this little body tag and you can put in some paragraphs and, and manipulate them in place, um, use bold text or whatever. Uh, we're just trying to do that using modern tooling, uh, as you mentioned, Polymer web components, and see where we can go with, you know, the more modern web. Well, yeah, and that's one of the things that's been really interesting over the last uh, dozen years or so. I'm, I've never been much of a front-end guy, although I, I know just enough jQuery to be dangerous. So um, <clears throat> my, my other client, uh, my, my, my secondary client, well, my prime 
client I've had the longest time, uh, Insight Cruises, uh, has a lot of jQuery on their uh, website now. And some of it was rather clever. Some of it is, is uh, very confusing to come back to uh, years later and try to figure out what the hell I was trying to do with that. Um, but um, the one thing that is getting consistently better and better is the idea of uh, web components and, and uh, pluggable interfaces and uh, style sheets that, uh, that only apply to a certain section, which allows you to build up these, these items. And in, even, in a sense, uh, you're extending HTML. You're defining new elements that you can drop in. Is that, is that the basis of hacks? Yeah, it's, it's a pretty brilliant specification. So um, people, I mean, still ask people if they're using it, and people go, oh, I didn't even know that still existed. Um, it was proposed around 2011, and it's just one of those chicken and egg scenarios where you need enough developers to adopt the thing and enough browsers to go, oh, hey, these developers are adopting it, um, which, as you mentioned, Polymer before. Polymer helps with a little bit of that. It's kind of that glue layer to help progress the web. But, um, yeah, it's basically you're defining your own new HTML tags and having a way of getting those uh, recognized by the browser. Um, so uh, Chrome... And uh, Opera and Safari uh, natively recognize web components. Uh, Firefox is supposed to come along at about October 23rd, I think, is the next potential release for it. And uh, IE and Edge, you have a polyfill. And uh, Explain polyfill. Oh, sorry. So it's um, kind of a little JavaScript shim that basically teaches that browser, hey, uh, if you see, in this case, a, a custom element. So let's say it's a my hyphen link uh, you know, brackets, um, that it teaches that browser, hey, you can interpret this and escalate it into this chunk of code, which you mentioned, the scope CSS and, and whatnot. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this framework and or what Hacks is doing is really all client side, right? There's a, it's, this is as opposed to something like, uh, like PHP or some other templated system that uh, requires the server to uh, render uh, final HTML in order to be able to display it in the browser. Am I, am I accurate there? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of what Hacks is doing is just leveraging this approach. So Hacks itself is ultimately on the interface. It's a bracket Hacks hyphen body tag. And then all the guts of the HTML go in between there. And then Hacks understands how to moderate that and interface with it so that when you click a paragraph, you're editing a paragraph. When you select a uh, an image, uh, you can modify that image, but it also understands how to talk to other web component tags. Um, so if we have a you know media hyphen image, and that's not a normal HTML tag, we can kind of imbue it with these additional properties um, to understand the design better and how to modify it. But yeah, it all happens on the front end. And what what were you using before this? I mean, obviously there were there was you know raw polymer, and people had like uh, you know had been developing web components. Uh, what brings together the Hacks project? What makes that the, the unique element here? Uh, so uh, I, like you, I'm not a classical front-end developer. Um, we got into, we got out of jQuery, we'll say, and uh, igniting uh, flame by rubbing sticks together on the web um, in February of last year. Um, so what we started doing is we started doing that for just design consistency to say, like, I'm not a very good designer. Obviously, that was a criticism made in the beginning. Um, and so if I want to make a card, it'd be awesome if I just had a tag that always was a card. Um, so Hacks is basically just leveraging that over and over again. The problem that we were seeing uh, at Penn State was uh, we've got these online courses we've got to make. We've got content contributors that know enough HTML to be dangerous, might know JavaScript uh, enough to be dangerous. But really, that's not sustainable um, for the production of, of advanced online materials. So we needed a way that people could manipulate you know, the DOM because they understand concepts of HTML, they understand concepts of design, but kind of be a level removed from actually having to do that. Oh, yeah. Um, so I am the front end, one of the front end people from the team, and I was brought on about last year. And, uh, and I think that uh, one of the big problems that we have is that we're all trying to solve the problem around the WYSIWYG editor. Um, until I joined the team, I was in another department at Penn State that handled online courses. And uh, what would happen is people wanted increasing flexibility beyond what CK Editor would do. And, and our way of working around that was we used semantic HTML and jQuery. The problem is that um, if you knew enough to be dangerous and then someone took over that course content, 
you can't always tell exactly, you know, what the tags happen to be doing or what the styles were behind it. And so our, our, our little rigged WYSIWYG uh, scenario sometimes failed just because somebody might, uh, might not realize what that they, what they were changing and altering. And there was an interest in building uh, rich multimedia into our courses and the problem of how to make that scale. And also to make it consistent be, uh, among authors, right? So that you had to have the, as you just said, so, somebody would make a, a YouTube widget and call it YouTube-widget and somebody else would make a YouTube insert or something, right? Right. That's That's definitely part of the interest in making things scale, making them consistent, but allowing people to have that flexibility. We're, um, we're about to implement um, a color scheme design system. It's a web component by itself called Simple Colors that allows people to select colors within reason and do it with uh, WCAG AA compliant contrast. And so that's one of the exciting things is that we can give people choices, but choices within limitations. And sometimes that means me limiting Brian. So now, a moment ago, you mentioned team uh, that you've been brought on board, and that's got my my spidey sense tingling here. Uh, uh, where who is behind all this? Uh, who's paying for it? But you know, where's it come from? I can't see any link on the website for going and paying for it. Paying for it? This is open source, Simon. What? Who pays for things? <laughs> uh, no. So Nikki and I both work at Penn State's College of Arts and Architecture in a group called the Office of Digital Learning. Uh, so we help bridge uh, online courses for the university, deliver them for, through World Campus, also deliver courses uh, on site. So our college uh, this semester has about 3,500 online students alone um, through about 30 or 40 courses. And those courses are delivered through a system called Elms Learning Network, which we are creating hacks for. Um, so you mentioned both of you, you know, write content, you put it out on the web. Uh, online courses are really just structuring you know, a well-structured online course system. Um, the team gets a little squishy because um, two other members of our of our you know core team that work on Hacks and work on Elms work in uh, Penn State's Eberly College of Science in their Office of Digital Learning. So it immediately gets squishy because we both work in something called Office of Digital Learning, but they're not you know directly related. Um, a lot of the links actually go forward, which we probably should fix that. That's that's a good point. It, it's kind of like our offices link off and say like, hey. We do this thing called hacks, but you're right. We don't have a lot of the, the in reverse. So it, it's kind of just open community um, that's springing forth from higher ed. Right. Uh, and so how big is your team? Oh, I'm stupid. Sorry, Nikki. Carry on. No, that's okay. Um, what I was going to say is, is I think part of the reason it happened in, in our two shops is the content itself um, really pushes the envelope as opposed to other uh, course content. So an arts course, you have um, – obviously very rich visuals and audio um, and a science course you're talking about how to render math ml so we've been really um, we're the the heavy duty users that said well the WYSIWYG isn't enough for us and the course management system isn't enough for us we need to we need to change what we're doing and and when you think about the fact that our students are not just consumers of content but they're creating their own content now you give them a, a WYSIWYG that's been out since before they were born because some of these people are not much older than my own kids and uh, and we're not really giving them that cutting edge experience that they're paying for right so so I was going to ask how, how big is the team I looked on github it looked there were, like they were three people who've made commits recently, but I guess the team is bigger than that. Uh, so we have four, uh, four core contributors, um, if you will. We've had some, some other developers. Um, so ASU has been involved in uh, the Drupal 8 integration. It's where it also gets a little murky is Hacks is this pure front-end technology. However, there's all these different areas where it gets integrated. Um, so we've had people contribute uh, to the uh, Grab CMS integration, which speaks to Markdown based systems. We've had Drupal uh, integration that's been worked on and helped from ASU and a couple other places. So, like Hacks, the core of Hacks, I would say, is those four four people um, that we mentioned. But the other the other thing as to why we adopted Web Components is we'll bring in students or you know interns for a semester or so, and Web Components is something that we can say, hey, do you know HTML, CSS, and basic JavaScript? cool, run the script, we'll stamp out a little templated element, and then you kind of fill in the blanks. And so we've been able to really 
get people onboarded rapidly and building things in a sustainable way, you know, even even at the development layer, as Nikki mentioned, we're trying to do on the content layer. Right. So uh, look, I was looking at the, um, the the number of forks on the on GitHub uh, site, and it, I didn't see a huge number there. Do you have very much adoption outside your own uh, work area? Um, I have been promoting the crap out of this thing, <laughs> says Nikki. <laughs> um, so. So no, I mean we're getting a couple of people trickling in here and there. Um, I think a lot of it is um, really uh, we're trying to kind of chat, overturn the tables, if you will. Um, so we did a, a presentation at DrupalCon, Nikki and I did, in which most people came up to us afterwards and said, like, this is the most challenging talk that I've seen at one of these events, uh, and it's because we're trying to challenge people to say, yes, you're building all these complex workflows and you're modeling content in a system like Drupal or WordPress. That's great. How much of that are you doing as a result of poor UX at the end? And so mm -hmm. we're trying to almost flip this paradigm to say like, hey, you, everyone, we're building these really complex systems. You know Wix and Squarespace are out there and you're losing clients left and right to them. You might not realize it, but these closed solutions that happen to be like, hey, pay us 10 bucks and we'll give you website tonight software, they're coming for all of us. And so a little bit of it is the uptake of like, oh, well, I'm not, I can't integrate this into my project directly. The other part is it, this darn well better have a lot of people, you know, using it at a high scale. And so at Penn State, we just rolled this out uh, into our courses, uh, what, Nikki, like a, a couple weeks ago? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, some of this is, hey, this is this big idea. We put it out there. It's been, we've been developing assets for it. We've been wiring them into our own projects. And, um, you know, start, need to show and demonstrate success to really get it out to other people and go on, on really powerful Floss Weekly type shows to tell other people. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely the way to do things. So uh, how long has it been running then? You no, know, because my experience is it takes a decade to make an open source project get any scale. Wow, a decade. Uh, so uh, so Hacks is a subset of a project called Elms Learning Network. Um, uh, I've been working on Elms Learning Network since 2012, so I'm about six years through the 10-year cycle uh, there. Mm -hmm. um, but Hacks, um, we've started rolling it out into our own stuff about six months ago. Um, it was an idea on a whiteboard about three years ago, and we just never could seem to get to it. And when we'd get to it, we'd go like, oh, let's do this in jQuery. Uh, for, for the audio audience, I made a, a disgusting emoji face. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> so really development started uh, fully on this about last November. So we're looking right. at about a year's, almost a year's worth of, of effort poured in. So, the, the, I mean, that's still, that's still beta uh, in most life cycles. So I, I, it doesn't surprise me that you don't have a vast number of, uh, of uh, adopters yet. But I, I, you know, I think that if you're taking the right approach going out and uh, speaking to people where they are. How will you feel about other projects embedding this and forking it into their code? I mean, how how would you feel about uh, WordPress or uh, LibreOffice taking your work and integrating it into their code? Uh, that would be amazing. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> there's, a, there's a project called Sugi by Dr. Charles Severance. He's big in Sakai communities, and um, he teaches a, a giant uh, Python MOOC. Um, but open at Open Aperio earlier this year, he demonstrated integrating hacks into Sugi to put it in an LMS so that teachers would mm -hmm. natively have kind of this button to say, I want this advanced editor on this page. And that was totally a prototype, you know, proof of concept type of a thing. Um, but that's kind of where I see see this stuff heading. Um, it's a highly pluggable architecture. So part of it is, hey, let's make all these design assets. Let's treat the uh, the front end of the of the website as an API and the patterns between these little things as this little micro API to talk to, uh, which then hacks is just leveraging. But I think we'll see mass adoption uh, pick up once we switch um, off of a standard called HTML imports uh, over to something called JS modules, uh, because a lot, a lot more projects are building on JS modules and um, NPM type of workflows. And currently mm -hmm. we're on a Bower, a Bower workflow um, and Bower is is deprecated. So immediately, I know that's one thing where people jump in and say, like, I don't even, you know, I don't know how I'd put this in my build routine, so I don't even want to look at it. Right, right. So, uh, so I see that you picked the Apache license for it. 
Um, uh, was there a reason behind that? You know, the, the, uh, it's the license I would probably have picked given your circumstances, so congratulations. But uh, what was your thought flow behind picking Apache? Um, so Elm's Learning Network is uh, GPL v3, um, just because it's this like meta project of projects. Um, and that was that was done in conjunction with uh, discussing with the Aperio Foundation, who kind of mentors, you know, up and coming projects. And when I talked to them about hacks and about our design assets, they were like, if you ever want these to, you know, really take off and have people leverage them, which um, to date, we have 193 independent design assets that work anywhere as far as web components. So uh, it was recommended that we pick Apache 2 just because that would have the greatest likelihood of people taking all those little pieces and branching them off and then, you know, uh, doing pull requests back into individual ones potentially. Well, Simon's got some more questions, and I have some more questions, but before we do that, we have also a very important message. Because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean provides the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications with droplets, virtual machines that are a scalable compute platform with add-on storage, security, and monitoring capabilities. Choose from the standard or CPU-optimized droplets and customize from there. DigitalOcean is designed for developers. The easy-to-use control panel and API lets developers spend more time coding and less time managing their infrastructure. Industry-leading price to performance. Access the compute resources you need at the lowest rates, saving up to 55% compared to other cloud providers. And you'll always know what you will pay per month with a flat pricing structure across all data center regions. Included at no additional cost. 99.99% uptime SLA. Cloud firewalls. Monitoring and alerting, full DNS management, global data centers, enterprise SSDs, easy-to-use API. Over 150,000 businesses, including some of the world's fastest-growing startups like me, rely on DigitalOcean to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry-leading price performance. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash floss. That's do.co slash f-l-o-s-s for a free $100 credit. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support of Floss Weekly. And now here's some questions I had about this. So uh, actually, I'll take the question from the chat room first. Um, uh, Strengths asked, can it be done with WebAssembly? Uh, I have no idea. (laughs) <laughs> Neither did I, but I thought I'd ask that because we do take questions from our chat room, regardless of whether the hosts or guests understand it entirely. So that's kind of how this works. I was also curious, uh, because Nikki, you brought up a little bit earlier about um, being accessible and accessibility compliance. How does how does a structure like, uh, like uh, 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 Hacks uh, support that? Well, um, because we've... Uh, you know, we work in online courses, and a lot of times um, students with disabilities tend to gravitate toward those because they allow them some ability that maybe the physical space can't. Uh, we have very, very high numbers of students with disabilities taking our online courses. And so we've worked with a disabilities office and and learned how to make things keyboard accessible, color contrast accessible. Um, we have somebody who tests not just with, with JAWS, which most people thinking about accessibility are thinking about maybe JAWS or um, voiceover, but we also are testing for Kurzweil. And um, a number of our students use Kurzweil, uh, the tool, so that their content can be read out loud um, or it can be magnified or highlighted. Um, the reason why that's way more popular than JAWS is because it it's a, a tool used for students with low vision, we have students who have cochlear implants that are learning how to hear language again, um, students with uh, dyslexia. And so we actually have about twice as many Kurzweil users as JAWS. And so the semantic HTML part was very important to me. And that's what drew me to the idea of web components, because I, I came from a world where if it wasn't server side rendered, Kurzweil would probably choke on the JavaScript. And so I've always I've always thought of using progressive enhancements so that if the JavaScript failed, students still had access to the content. And what I like about web components is that even if you're not supporting those custom elements, if we're designing those co- components to be semantic, we still have some level of content that people can access. 
Is there any way to uh, restrict, say, bad color combos for people that are colorblind? So that's what, uh, as we start implementing our simple colors web component, that's what that will do is that we, uh, it allows a light and dark theme and uh, an accent color. And depending upon the light or dark theme, the accent color changes. It uses CSS variables and, and we figured out a, uh, a set of 180 colors and what works with what. And uh, as we start implementing that in Hacks, the components will be using those color combinations so that we're sure that they're uh, WCAG 2.0 AA compliant. Um, one of the first components that we wrote to use that would be the um, Alley Media Player. And that's our, uh, our proprietary accessible video player that we've created as part of the project uh, with clickable interactive transcripts and captioning. And like I said, the accessible color contrast. Cool, cool. Uh, uh, Brian, I think this question is more for you. Uh, I think you mentioned Wix just a few minutes ago, and I'm wondering, would I be able to just, um, to tie into our sponsor, rent a digital ocean box, uh, one of the cheap ones, and put some sort of web server or something on it? I mean, what would you recommend there, and essentially get everything that Wix is providing for me? Yeah, so that that would certainly be kind of in the roadmap of what we're looking to do. Um, so right now, Hacks in a, has um, integrations with uh, Drupal 6 to go back in history, uh, Drupal 7, 8, um, Backdrop CMS, which is a fork of Drupal, uh, Grab CMS, uh, it works with Electron apps, and there's another system I'm working on called Hack CMS, which is just a handful of lines of PHP to be a minimal backend so that you can basically orchestrate the files needed to, uh, to save data. Uh, when Hacks initiates a save. So, yeah, um, we've been exploring uh, DigitalOcean that you would throw that on. Uh, we've also been doing a lot of uh, local work with uh, a project called DDEV, uh, which is a Docker container uh, image. And so we would spin it up locally, uh, be able to crank out these these files that are effectively static, um, and then publish straight to surge.sh um, or uh, Beaker Browser is another thing that I've been messing around with, which is a decentralized publishing app. Uh, so yeah, that's absolutely uh, within scope. Is to try and we want you to be able to take back your content and great authoring experience is the easiest way to do that. Awesome. So I could have a much better editing experience then uh, uh, if by using this rather than using Wix because that's probably using you know two year two year old technology. Not to not to not to dis, just you know to disparage anybody else that's out there that's using Wix and stuff. But uh, yeah, that'd be really great. Um, I also noticed in one of the videos, uh, the word, uh, this website, webcomponents.org, was said over and over again. Uh, I don't know if that was you, Nikki, or somebody, but uh, it was like over and over again. Uh, now, that's not <laughs> related That's not related to hacks, is it, except hacks can use all those? Uh, so webcomponents.org is this uh, community site started by Google, basically just to help promote the fact that this technology exists. Um, so like if you imagine it's really easy to go and promote something like react because or Re or angular because you can point to almost like an organization working on the thing and you can point to projects at the end um, it's a little harder to point to just like hey uh, paragraph tags are cool right all right so like a, a spec is a little hard to get really excited about and so webcomponents.org is more or less uh, anybody that has created web components whether they be in polymer uh, in Skate JS or vanilla JavaScript or Stencil, there's a ton of different libraries to be able to produce web components. Uh, you can submit them there, and it'll just uh, index them so that you can search for other people's components. Um, so Hacks is made up of you know dozens of components, potentially hundreds, uh, that have been pulled from webcomponents.org. Uh, Google's Google's element set that makes up YouTube, for example, they leverage things like paper hyphen buttons so that when you tap on a button on YouTube, it does a nice little ripple effect. Well, you can get that component from webcomponents.org and use it in your projects. So if you imagine that the hacks tags are made up of those tags, um, but then whenever we want to wire something up to hacks, we basically create our own new web component and it bubbles up a little JSON blob that says, hey, if uh, an editing experience exists, this is the way to work with me. And so uh, we can't natively take other people's components and just um, and just write into them, um, kind of like a you know, it's not like an Envision app type of a thing where you're building out 
uh, that structure, although there's a project called Vadden that, that does that. Um, but we have been able to take uh, other people's tags and within about two minutes wire them to hacks. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. And so are the components that you're creating for hacks also being indexed by webcomponents.org? Yes. Yeah. So that's a um, kind of a fundamental difference in philosophy between what we're building and say Gutenberg, if you've heard of Gutenberg, um, which is a WordPress website tonight type editor, is that our we're building design assets, pure design assets, and then we're wiring them to hacks after the fact. So the more sophisticated our design assets get as we build for static websites, um, let's say, we'll, we'll create, you know, someone on the team will create something for a static website. And then at the end, once it's implemented, we'll go, well, how would we make that a repurposable API and then fire a message up if hacks is available? So that allows us to leverage every aspect of it. We're not writing things just for hacks. If hacks goes away, it works perfectly fine. If you use it in your projects and you don't use hacks, then awesome. Uh, it's it's really about kind of expanding the capabilities design wise, and then leveraging that as an API, and that's where Hacks comes in. So uh, let's go back to the fundamentals again, just for a second. So Web Component consists of some amount of HTML, uh, including other tags from other Web Components, some uh, built-in or uh, localized CSS, and then some sort of JavaScript to give it behavior. Is that a fair? assessment yeah yep um so basically yeah you have your you have your html your javascript your css you can include other web components so it becomes the lego effect and i think you've probably seen in some of our videos we sort of lego themed it because it's it's in the true spirit of open source we're using other people's components to make new components to then share back to the community so I can leverage that button in the video player and then share the video player back and then create a wrapper to pull that video player into hacks and make it hack specific so that they're always at, at some point in that, uh, in that chain, you might find a component that's useful for you and for the project that you're using. Um, that's part of the appeal of it and part of the reason why we're able to develop with such a small team. Now, when I'm using one of the things that came off of webcomponents.org, do I need to download it and install it on my server, or is the browser actually going out to that site or wherever it links to and fetching it? Um, we would, while you can, just point to like a CDN uh, publicly to load them if you have the right cross-origin request uh, set up. Um, we, we do recommend that you actually pull them down into your builds so it's a lot of pull it down, run it through a build routine, and then um, you know uh, use like Webpack or something like that, which you know parses out just the pieces you use versus all the documentation about the thing in question. Um, you can leverage them off of CDNs. We do it for some demos. Um, there's actually a, a browser injection plugin that I, I made that's a little bookmarklet that you can inject hacks into other domains be using that approach. Um, but obviously that has security implications. <laughs> I uh, tried that, and I couldn't get it to work. I thought maybe it was because I was trying Safari, and I know Safari has a different strategy for bookmarklets. So I went to Chrome and still tried it, and I still couldn't get it to work. So maybe you need better instructions about how to install it. Instructions we definitely need, as you mentioned at the beginning. <laughs> so how much of this – so I, I, the question I raised at the beginning of the show, I, I'm sure this is still pretty a young project. It's probably why you don't have a lot of actual – textbook material you only have wonderful uh, demos that i have to sit through um now they're, they're entertaining really they are but it's it's like again i i learn better by being able to scan a table of contents jumping immediately in my mind to the things that i think i'm going to need today and uh, reading that sort of stuff. is that on the roadmap for you definitely so uh part of this is part of the fact that hacks is for education is that um, so if we give content contributors a better authoring experience, in our case, our content contributors are instructional designers, people that put together course material, and faculty members. So the next level of abstraction up from that, once we you know, work through those issues, is, okay, well, normally they structure that stuff in outlines and hierarchies and you know, relate concepts visually. So we make a design that works there. That's actually a layer we're working on uh, right now in some of some of said you know, silly videos that are entertaining. Um, but so I don't want to put out documentation necessarily until I'm using hacks to do it. Like I want to chew my own dog food on this. Um, 
So we're, we're working on a lot of different uh, design patterns and systems that are just around you know, rapid content outline creation and hacks becomes the WYSIWYG part, but that outline is the critical piece towards our, us actually writing and distributing our documentation. So yeah, it's absolutely something we're aware of. I get that, get that criticism a lot. Um, there is a lot of documentation from me. down. Yes, from her. There is a lot of documentation <laughs> down in, in our elements themselves which is where our focus has initially been. Um, so like uh, I mentioned, we have 193 elements, I believe. Uh, every single one of them has a documentation site associated with it uh, so that you can use every single one of them as its own little API. Um, it's a huge advantage of polymers. It generates these little microsites if you write your element the right way. Um, and then the other aspect is that in hacks, uh, it's the repo is hacks-body, but in those elements, there's actually a ton of documentation but again, it's in you know comment form. So yes, it's it's absolutely something that's in our roadmap to attack. So uh, on one part of the demo, I saw the save button, so that you could actually send it back if it was properly configured. You could send it back to your WordPress installation. How how difficult is that? Are you just have you just reverse engineered the API for? Well, maybe not even reverse engineer. It might be published uh, API for uploading files to WordPress. Uh, so we don't have it working with WordPress yet. Um, but it would be pretty, it would be pretty minimal, um, just because, yeah, it basically, um, we need for hacks to work with any system. We'll say it doesn't have to be PHP based. We just happen to have done PHP before. Um, it needs a place to save that body of content. When someone hits the save button, it needs a place to handle file uploads. So like a, an endpoint to send them to, and it needs, um, you know, the ability to load this information in and place it on the interface. If we get those three things um, with a the system, then it it's there and it's working. Um, so, uh, for example, the, the a lot of the Drupal integrations are like a hundred or so lines, most of which are are just documentation. To be perfectly honest, um, because you have to be able to handle a post from the system. Um, then, because of the beauty of web components, our our hacks body tag we actually wrap in another tag much like web components you know with Nikki mentioned Legos so we'll have we have a CMS hyphen hacks tag specifically for integrating into content management systems so you basically feed it here's the endpoint for things and it should unpack and, and the rest should just work wow okay yeah, uh, how about test sorry go ahead go ahead oh I was gonna say very similar to, to the modules that people write for a tiny MCE or for CK editor to get them in, into a content management system uh, it would be very similar. Cool. We actually just had a question in the chat room, again, from Strength. So uh, based on previous experience, I don't know if any of us are going to be able to answer this, but here we go. Um, have you tested if the new template HTML tag can be integrated? It. I mean, we, we so we, we leverage the template yeah. tag heavily in our elements um, as far as placing that directly into the DOM. Uh, we do have elements that attempt to wrap it. Um, I don't think you can just write template natively into our into our hacks body thing though I haven't tried that it's a good question yeah i know the template is being used by angular dart as the placeholder for the actual html that needs to be dropped in but the browser never sees the template uh, tag because it has been already replaced with uh, what An angular had to generate um oh, i had a question that just just oh, broke out of my mind oh testing is this can you test this is it being tested so, Nikki, do you want to speak to testing on accessibility land? And I can speak to oh, lack yeah. of testing on, on visual land, although how we'll do that. So we, um, so we have uh, two accessibility groups at Penn State. We're so special. We have two groups for accessibility, or maybe we're just such a big organization. You can take it either way. But we have two accessibility groups that do testing for us. One is the testing group for the university proper, and the other group is specifically looking at um, – online courses and students with disabilities. So we have these two layers. I work with the online course, the thorough layer, as I'm developing a component so that I'm not completely developing a thing and finding out that I need to redo everything um, because I overlooked a piece. So we iteratively uh, drop samples to their office. They give us full in-depth reports. Um, so it's a, it, we, we do have the accessibility testing uh, underway. The and so we need to load it into the workflow, but this is another prime advantage of web components in general. Is um, we can place a single asset on a page, 
and then start to visual diff it uh, to see you know how it works by itself. So all of our elements, for example, we know exactly how they're going to look because they're in a vacuum. Um, the Shadow DOM API, which is part of the Web Component spec, effectively containerizes all the CSS and you know the, DOM, the little bits of DOM code that are in the template tag. And so as a result of that, if it looks correct in a vacuum, we are basically guaranteed it's going to look correct in hacks. Now, correct is to exactly what that thing looks like. It's not the interplay with other, other elements. And so when we get into layouts and, and grids and tables and things, uh, those are some areas that we need to attack and start to put in place some automated testing for sure. Cool. Yeah, I'm sure that's possible. JavaScript's pretty flexible that way. Uh, uh, will this work with can, – can TypeScript work with this if I prefer a, a slightly fancier JavaScript? Sure. Um, I think the Polymer Polymer elements have switched, um, at least the Polymer 1 hybrid ones, uh, they leverage TypeScript. So I haven't written any with TypeScript, but yeah, I'm almost positive you can. Awesome, awesome. And uh, actually, probably the last question I'm going to take from the uh, chat room here is Rever Reverb Mike, uh, very much regular in our, in our chat room. How many people are using hacks at this point? It sounds like just uh, groups within PSU, right? Those yeah, are... For... Oh, Go ahead, <laughs> for authoring content, um, we have uh, we have instructional designers that are using it. Um, but as of this semester, we have um, online students using it, and Penn State's online courses are uh, are practically a campus in and of themselves as far as population. This is the first week of classes. Um, nobody's beaten down our doors or asked me to come travel in through the traffic to to help you know troubleshoot something. So. Fingers crossed. And given that this is it so is, easy to edit, go ahead. Sorry, I, I was going to say it is primarily within the Penn State audience at this time. Um, although it's starting to leak out to other developers for indie projects and things. The interesting thing about semester start for us, sorry, um, is that we because we have so many users online and they're all getting into their course materials in that first week of classes. We've been known to take down other um, systems, some that are um, proprietary systems that we're paying for, some of our own home brood systems. But thus far, um, you know, we haven't had to add hacks to the bingo card of what will go down. Nice, nice, nice. And I was also actually just going to, I'm just wondering out loud, can a course creator create the, uh, say, the, 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 the sectional exam using hacks, and then have students basically return their answers as edited fields in that same form? That um, We're actually using web components in our studio tool for students who have to submit creative work. And um, we, don't have, we don't have hacks live in it, but the components that would eventually become hacks are there. And so part of my project for this year is to actually – pivot a little bit away from hacks proper and actually start looking at making that studio tool have hacks. Because like I said, we have, we have students who are also producers of content and honestly, modern education should be about the student who also produces. So it's, it's very important for us to, to have, you know, these tools in place for them. But you're right. You can absolutely see that convergence just because of the spec, right? We're, we're implementing the spec everywhere. And so then hacks immediately starts to be on the table for other projects that previously, you know, Nikki would have been working on the studio tool in a vacuum for me working on a design, you know, the, the content design in a vacuum from our editor. And so it really unlocks this new world of modularity. Cool. Uh, are there components? Uh, no, we're almost out of time, so I should stop asking questions. I'll maybe I'll bring you back in another year or two to see how far it's gotten. But um um, and actually, let, let me just not not ask that question I was about to ask. Um, the um, um, well, okay, yeah, we're almost out of time. Is there anything we didn't ask that you want to make sure our audience is aware of before we let you go? Okay. Um, wow, what didn't you ask? Oh, one of the things that Hacks does that um, you won't get out of a typical WYSIWYG editor is that you are able to actually search other open repositories of content. And this is important to me because normally you'd go to a bunch of disparate systems, throw in a bunch of embed codes, 
or at the very least, you'd have to search outside of the system. And what we realized is that if you really want people to contribute to repositories or get things from repositories, you need to bring that into the workflow. So it's a WYSIWYG editor that is connected to repositories. And I, I really find that exciting because people are more likely to contribute if they immediately perceive the benefits and if it's also already part of their workflow. It's why we bring blood drives on campus instead of make people go to them. Cool. And Brian, same question? Yeah, that's, that's actually the exact same point. I can, um, I can embed a YouTube video and search for it natively in any hack system in about seven seconds and have it rendered responsibly and accessibly. Um, I, I do demos where I put tables in place, right? So we'll make a, a table component uh, called CSV render, and I'll dump in a CSV file and I'll render it as 100% accessible uh, HTML in seconds. And so it's kind of those, it's usually why we're doing these video-based demos is, is kind of to envision the possibilities of what this enables you to do once you have the web, you know, and your front-end assets as an API. Um, but yeah, we just keep adding sources, whether it's YouTube or Google Poly, uh, to be able to pull the rest of the web together and throw it in place into your browser. Um, you know, it really reduces the complexity that your system needs if all this is happening on the front end. Well, given the number of people that listen to this show and watch this show over the years, um, I would imagine that part of what you're interested in is expanding the community. Do you want just uh, EDUs or do you want uh, commercial uh, people to help contribute to you? Anybody. Any and everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can see an application for this in any WYSIWYG editor, as a replacement for any WYSIWYG editor in any content system. Wow. Could I use it just to drop in, uh, I don't know the names, you mentioned the names earlier, the existing, um, the existing WYSIWYG editors. Could I just replace that on my web page? That is, yeah, we have a tag called WYSIWYG hyphen hacks, uh, which seeks to do that. Um, that's basically how the grab CMS integration works is it more or less just replaces the text area with this hacks tag. Um, and then dump, whenever you hit save, you're basically take hacks is looking at the contents that you've written and it dumps them to that field and then presses the save button for you pretty much. Awesome, awesome. Well, I can already see a few instances for this. So last two questions or my audience gets mad at me. What's your uh, favorite scripting language and what's your favorite text editor? We'll start with Nikki. Oh, wow. Um, anymore, I've been um, I've been using uh, Visual Studio Code for my text editor. Oh, I used to be... I uh, love that editor. I used to be That's text... a great editor. <laughs> I used to be a text wrangler person, but... Uh, but yeah, I, I am now hooked, and I am a JavaScript person. Yes, as, that's, that's a fair as answer. Kind of <laughs> yeah, I kind of figured that. And uh, and uh, Brian, same questions. Uh, yeah, I've, I've moved off Sublime recently to VS Code because there's a plugin that makes VS Code look like Sublime, and I found out that was why I really liked Sublime. Um, and uh, and JavaScript, you know, I, I did PHP for like nine years, but now this is all I'm going to do. Yeah, I know. It's really nice when you just let the back end be the back end and you can actually work on the things that are actually the, the coolest to look at. And I agree with VS Code, man. I'm, I've started to use it. I finally got away from um, using Emacs for everything, although I still do my mail and IRC inside Emacs. Um, but no, and I'm using VSC uh, because I can give it Emacs uh, key bindings. So I am already productive with it, which is really, really cool. Hey, guys, it's been great having you on. I hope your uh, community grows as part of being on here. Uh, I wish you all the best, and uh, um, I'm, I'll be ha happy to have you back in a year or two so we can see where this has actually gone, because it still sounds like a really young project, and I'm very happy to uh, promote it a little bit more uh, later on. So thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right, great, great. That was uh, scroll, scroll, scroll. I scrolled away from the names, damn it. Uh, sorry, uh, darn it. Now you have to bleep that. Uh, Brian Olendike and uh, Nikki Masaro Kaufman talking to us about, uh, I was going to say about Wix. <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> it's one of those days. Hacks, hacks. Let's do hacks. Okay, uh, what do you think there, uh, Brian, uh, <laughs> Brian Simon? <laughs> I'm getting tired. I'm getting tired. I can already tell. Yeah, well, Alan, um, I have to say that uh, that's pretty cool to me. Uh, I, you know, I, I would very much like to see those tools integrated into the front end of the, I have to use about five different CMSs and I would love to have that tool integrated into the front end of those CMSs for authoring content and authoring fragments. 
And uh, I think that the, the key to their future is to find uh, a, 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 some other CMSs and to begin to get that adopted as a default or one of the options for the editing environment. If they can get Drupal to do it, that would be great. And I think they did the right thing going to DrupalCon and present, presenting about it. I think there are some other uh, CMSs out there that are quite critical to get into. Um, and I, I think it would be great if they were to go on a, a CMS conference world tour uh, demonstrating that it's possible to give ordinary people authoring capabilities that are both uh, going to produce accessible content and that are going to produce rich content. Uh, so more power to them. I think it's, it's, it's very cool stuff. Well, I remember using the, uh, I don't remember what it was. It was a PHP-based database thing, and there was a content management system, and I remember trying to use it for a project that was about 10 years ago. It wasn't Drupal, though. It was something earlier, something very early on. I forget the name now. It'll come to me right after I stop the show. That, that's guaranteed. <laughs> uh, but I remember trying to use that, and it just was just ugly. It's like if I wanted to upload a file so I could link to it, that was an entirely different interface. Uh, you know, and if I wanted to, say, move stuff around, I had to go to a different interface that actually worked on the styles. And it was like, wow, what a... What a nightmare. I can't see how anybody uses stuff like this. So, yeah. So this, this looks really good. I'm, I, I really wish them the best. This sounds like a great way to leverage modern browsers to do exactly what we want them to do. Well, speaking of upcoming guests, which is my awkward transition for the week, uh, we've got cryptocurrency for a couple of – or blockchain for the next two shows. Uh, Simon, I, you don't actually, have to you know, either of those. We, had complaints. we did have some complaints earlier that there was no blockchain in this program. And, I saw that know, in the chat room. Yeah, you need to be more careful and make sure there's some blockchain in all of these programs because, you know, this is now Blockchain Weekly. Probably fund uh, Wix with – or wait, not Wix. <laughs> Sorry, I did it again. Hacks <laughs> with, uh, with blockchain. Oh. They should just sell – they should sell Hacks, hacks coins with, uh, with uh, yeah, stuff on yeah. there. Uh, oh, the, the chat room actually has a Joomla. That's the one I'm thinking of. I, I, thank you, Ayatala. Yeah, uh, uh, Joomla. That was what I was, I was thinking of. Uh, used a PHP database and a bunch of other crazy stuff. Okay, so coming up next week, cryptocurrency, uh, Monero. Cryptocurrency, but private, untraceable, and fungible. Well, that'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah, Aon, yeah. Ion, I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, this is the one you're going to be amazed at. A multi-tier system designed to address unsolved questions of scalability and interoperability in blockchain networks. Mm, uh, oh, I, I, I so good feel those buzzwords. Oh, Buzzard bingo. Yes. We're going to be playing the cards all the way around. Uh, Sanoid, which I think Aaron has already agreed to be on because he's a data guy. Uh, Policy-driven snapshot management and replication tools currently using ZFS for underlying next-gen storage with explicit plans to support ButterFS when ButterFS becomes more reliable. That may be a while. Primarily intended yeah, for Linux, yeah. but BSD use is supported and reasonably frequently tested. Following that, Vaden, Vaden, something with two A's. Uh, and I, I don't know what year it is, but it's Java-based web development platform. I, I think the late 90s called, and they want their, their web development back. I'm following that, going to be a great show. Uh, Vicky Brasur, uh, she's a big open source uh, documenter uh, contributor over the years. Uh, have, you, have you met Vicky? Yeah, she's on the uh, open source initiative board at the moment, and she's, uh, I'm the president, and she's the vice president of OSI at the moment. Oh, so of course, you might want to be on that show then. I don't know. We'll see. Um, uh, she did the uh, Pro Conference 2018 keynote on the importance of the ecosystem and how we're polluting it and we need to stop it. So that was a really, really, really great talk. Well received. Following that, Sway. Sway is a tiling Wayland compositor and drop-in replacement for the i3 window manager for X11, which means nothing to me because I don't run Linux. But apparently some Linux people will know what that means and they'll come back and listen to the show. Just added to the show, uh, we had a request uh, to promote Open Rhine Ruhr which is a German open source two-day conference in early November. So one of the coordinators of that is going to come on. I am assumed that he's going to be speaking English to my audience, but I'm guessing most of the conference is uh, is going to be in German, so that might actually narrow the possibility. Uh, you, you, can, you can never be sure with those conferences. They've just had FrostCon over in um, uh, Bonn recently, and a good portion of that conference is conducted in English because they want to have uh, other people from across Europe coming in to join in with the conference. And so um, uh, English is the second language of so many people that it's a good choice for the conference. And honestly, they speak English better than you and I do, Randall. So uh, there's really no problem. Good, good, good. So I may even go there. That'd be kind of fun. I haven't been to Germany for a while. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave out the normal sort of end stuff. It's going to be the same as every single show, So and I'm running out of time. So, But I do want to plug that uh, we're, I'm going to be at DragonCon in Atlanta this weekend doing five talks on the EFF track. If you see me 
please come up and say hi. I'm really approachable. I'm not. I don't play star power or anything. And if you've been to any of my conferences, you know I'm just. I'm just a guy walking around doing my stuff. I'll be at the All Things Open in Raleigh in October. I'll be both speaking and I'll be looking for Foss Weekly guests. I'll be in Siegel in November. We had the coordinator for Siegel on a re- recent show. That'll be in Seattle. And KubeCon in December also has press, uh, trying to look for people that are doing Kubernetes sort of things. Uh, and I'll be there. That's also in Seattle. So I'll get to see my brother in Olympia a couple times going up that way. Uh, anything you want to plug there, um, Simon? Simon, I got it right this time, right? I, I'd like to get people from all over Europe to come along to the LibreOffice conference, which is in Tirana, Albania on the 26th of September. That's going to be a great conference in a city that so many people in Europe have never had the chance to visit. And I would very much recommend going to that. I'm also giving the keynote at Mindtrack in Tampere in Finland uh, on the 10th of October. And I'd love to see people there. And uh, I'll be speaking at the Spec and Tech um, uh, meetup in Trento in Italy on the 17th of October. Uh, and then I'll hopefully be speaking at MozFest in London on the weekend of the 26th of October. And uh, that's probably as far as I should go. Oh, I'll be at Freenode Live, which is coming up at the beginning of November. And um, I'll be giving the keynote at the Developer Relations Conference in London on the 8th of November. So do please come along to any of those. Uh, tell the conference organizers that you heard on Floss Weekly how fantastic their conference was, and that's why you're attending. And that way they they might have me back again. You never know. Yeah, exactly. It's part of why they, uh, they've now been continuously inviting me to conferences because I keep mentioning those conferences now on this show. I'm saying, I'm going to be there, I'm going to be there. That's part of the that's part of the deal, though. Simon, thanks once again for uh, co-hosting and uh, bailing me out occasionally when I get a little uh, tongue-tied, and, and uh, glad you were here to ask the questions you asked. It's been a great pleasure to be back, and I I hope that I'll be able to do one or two more shows, particularly maybe one of those blockchain shows, although I think you need to get David Gerard, who's the author of uh, Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain, to come on and ask the difficult questions, maybe in my place. I could do something like uh, the Twit Triangulation Show, where I have two guests that are sort of opposed, and I'm just the moderator. That would be kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah, that would be cool. Very, very cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, great, Simon. Thank you, and we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly.